All right. Well, let's get the show on the road. Um, my name is Alicia and I'm with America Scores Bay Area. And I want to thank everyone for attending today and uh, supporting our women and girls empowerment. Um, America Scores Bay Area uh, helps underserved youth with after school programs. And we do this with soccer, poetry writing, and service learning. We're over, I think we're in over 80 schools in the Bay Area. So um, we're all over, so it's great. Um, we wanna thank our partners, Goal 5, and someone in the audience today is going to win some Goal 5 products. So that's a good thing. And our other partner is Women in Soccer, and it's a free membership and it's a great organization to join, and you should join. Um, and I am going to read a poem from one of our poet athletes. This is Jimena, and she is in fifth grade from um, Alba Elementary. And it's called That Is That. In soccer, I like scoring. I give the strongest kick to the ball. My coach is not snoring. The referee makes a loud call. I think halftime is boring. I just want to play and give it my all. The goalie blocks my shot. He is fast as a cat. My cleats hit the ground, splat, splat, splat. I like soccer and that is that. So with that, I am going to hand over the microphone to Cassie Gray, who is from Female Footballers, the founder and CEO, who has kindly, um, not volunteer, but <laughs> Creed <laughs> kind of nudge to do um, some interviews for us. She did a session on Monday. So thank you so much, Cassie. And thank you, Leslie, for being here. And I'll let you take it over. All right. Well, at Female Footballers, we try to provide um, role models for young girls. And it feels very full circle right now that I get the opportunity to introduce one of my true role models in my life. Um, she isn't only the first woman I ever really saw um, in a position of power, but she's one of the pioneers in our sport that wrote the script for females in positions of power. And her monstrous and impressive resume is um, it, not only as a player, but as a coach is amazing. She's um, you know, four-time All-American and captain that played at UC Berkeley or Cal, um, go Bears. She, uh, she garnered you know, the Cal Female Athlete of the Year, or excuse me, Athlete of the Decade, Pac-12 um, All-Century Team, Cal Hall of Fame, Lara Legends. As a coach, she coached at Cal, San Diego State, and an impressive 26 seasons and most winningest coach in University of Washington's history. Um, and if that wasn't enough, she's also ODP Regional National Youth Coach, as well as a uh, previous president of United so uh, Soccer Coaches. And most recently, we're gonna discuss a little bit about today, the commissioner of our new Girls Academy. So welcome, Leslie, thank you for being here. Thanks, Cassie, thanks for, uh, th I only learned last night that you were going to be uh, on here with me interviewing and it was like the highlight of my day yesterday because I was like, oh, I don't even know what's happening tomorrow. Is it just gonna be me talking to, to nobody? <laughs> anyway, so I'm so relieved and happy you're here with me and yeah, go Bears. Good, yeah, so that's awesome. Um, I'm thrilled. This is so cool. I never get, whenever we have, for those of you who don't know, um, Leslie and I are both alums of Cal and we often get to do some really cool alumni events, but it's large group things and I've never really gotten to have this kind of a chat um, with one of my idols. So I'm stoked to get to ask a lot of these questions today. Our first question being, which I don't know a lot of these answers, but um, where and why did you find the game? You know, what age were you? What led you to soccer? And um, at what age did that start? Yeah, I, I, you know, my story is one, I, I, I think how I was led to soccer is I had a, um, I grew up in a family of four with two older brothers and a younger brother and uh, a single mom. My parents were divorced when I was probably around six. And um, so I just, we did everything outside. We grew up near the beach. So everything we did was disorganized activity for the most part. Um, and we re really didn't have the, the, you know, financial means to do a ton um, of organized activities, whether it was sports or whatever. But my mom one year did sign my brothers up for Boy Scouts. Um, and she mistakenly signed up to be a den mother. 
And the next year, I remember, I think I was probably in like the third grade. I said, can I be a Girl Scout? And I think being a den mother was probably like the low light of my mom's life. She's any, for anyone that's ever met my mom, um, she, I don't know, she's, she's kind of a people person, but that's not how you would describe her. She's, she's a little bit more matter of fact and just kind of, eh, she's not going to like yuck it up with the moms and she's kind of down to business, you know, worker bee. And uh, being a den mother wasn't her favorite. So I went to her and I said, it's really not that expensive. Can I be a Girl Scout? And this, I brought her the sign up form and she goes, no. <laughs> can you find something else to do? And I was like, oh, okay. So a um, little time passed and uh, I grew up in the South Bay in Southern California and I, I saw a sign for AYSO for soccer. And I said, okay, this looks like something maybe she'd say yes to. So I said, can I play soccer? She says, how much does it cost? And what do I need to, can you get there on your own? <laughs> I said, I'll find out. So go back, go back to my mom. I'm really painting her out to be a little bit more of a battle axe than she is. She's a uh, um, it led to this. So my mom said, sure, you know, all you need are a pair of cleats, let's get you those and, and off you go. And I just loved it. Um, you know, and, uh, I, it was one of those things that a team sport always seemed to be the thing that I gravitated towards as opposed to individual sports. Um, I, I again, having all brothers, it was the female camaraderie early on in my life was important because I didn't have sisters and girls, to be honest to you, were like a phenom to me. I didn't know what the deal was with how girls acted and girly girls at the time. Like I was just much more of what back then would be called a tomboy. And, uh, and so I, it was, it was fun to, for me to be able to interact with peers. And it was just a sport that, again, it seemed like it was honestly for everyone, like the physical attributes you had to have, whether you were small or tall or whatever, it didn't matter um, that everybody could play. And I, I, I loved it and must've shown a little bit of a propensity towards it but I stayed in it because of the people like my friends played and that was that was what kept me in. I feel like that's a theme when we're looking at all of these different interviews this week on the summit a lot of the women that we've spoken to have talked about the camaraderie piece and what you get out of the sport outside of the technical tactical physical side of our sport so would you say you're drawn to the team aspect did you find that you found a lot of confidence through the sport too that you were good at it or you felt good at it? Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, you and I cast, we, we've been on some of these things before in this topic of confidence and girls and coaching females, et cetera. And I, I think it was probably in early on in my coaching career, when I realized I looked around and I played, I thought with the majority of people I played with in, in youth sports were like confident girls and we all were like in it to win and compete and, or I just didn't notice the ones that weren't, but, and I had to kind of fend for myself and my family. So it was like confidence. What do you mean? Of course I can compete. Of course I can win. Of course I can, you know, try to be the best and be okay with it. And if I fall on my face, like if I'm going to sit there and wallow in that, like no one's going to come looking for me. My brothers certainly aren't. So the only way you had to do is just pick yourself up and go. And um, as a young coach, one of the things for me that, um, that I, I, I realized was like, Oh my gosh, like, not everyone's like me. <laughs> like there are some, there are girls that really struggle with confidence or self-esteem or just feeling as though um, they're good enough in, in, in anything, in sport, in life. It usually stems from something else outside of sport. So I feel really, really fortunate that I never, for the majority of my playing career or coaching career or time, I took very little dings to my confidence and I just would never really let someone take that away from me. But I know that's not the case with a lot of girls. Um, and I think you had a unique way of getting into the sport, like you said. So not only a unique perspective of confidence, but a unique perspective in, in that you found the sport on your own. You brought it to your parent. These days, that's not really the case. We know with a lot of athletes kind of, a lot of the time we hear, you know, siblings help us get into a sport. But even these days, there's a lot of parents that are pushing kids at a younger age to get into the sport. How did you come to be playing at such a competitive level and, and end up playing at Cal? Can you tell us a little bit about about that? Yeah, um, you know, my, my high school soccer uh, ended up, you know, high school and club soccer ended up being something that uh, really, really shaped my life in a lot of ways. And so many things came full circle. I never intended to do it past high school, to, to be honest, but I found myself by the time I was like eighth grade, ninth grade, um, I was the youngest person on my U19 team. So I joined a team when I was just turning 13. Um, and I was a way late developer, like, didn't start my period till I was 16 plus, didn't grow. I was like five foot when I was a freshman in high school. I was five, seven when I graduated from high school and I was five, 10 when I got out of college. I mean, I grew late. Um, 
And so for me, I played volleyball, but I learned to be a setter. And then when I got taller, I was like, oh, I can hit. <laughs> and so um, I, I played on my same U19 team from the time I was 13 until I was 18. Um, I went to college uh, as a 17 year old at UC Irvine, which didn't have soccer, but I lived close enough to home that I played one more year on my club team. And I thought, okay, I'm young enough still, I qualify, I'll still play. So I went from being the youngest person on my team to the oldest. A younger team in our area joined our team and we ended up being one of the best teams in, in not just in Southern California, not just in California in the West region, but we ended up being one of the best teams in the nation. And I fortunately um, latched on to some people who um, had, had had, I wouldn't say a better, maybe a little bit more of a rich soccer experience than I did. They traveled to Europe with the team. I'd never done that before. Um, they, you know, had played in different tournaments that I had not played in before on my team, but we had, I had one coach the whole way through. And when this younger team joined ours, I ended up went, going to college with like six of them. <laughs> so I, I was in college. Was Fram that we're talking about? Yep. Brian Boswell's team. Yeah. Fram. So um, the, the, the PV breakers are the team that joined us. So it was Catherine and Trudy and Lynn. And I mean, all these people from the Palos Verdes Peninsula and the South Bay ended up gravitating up to Cal. I was already in college and they were going away to school. And I said, um, I remember getting recruited by Santa Clara, Santa Barbara and, and Cal and then saying, you know, and I, I said, I'm already in college. I don't, you know, they're like, oh, well you can, you know, you're still playing on your club team. And so I ended up getting recruited at Cal out of college. So I just did an interconference or an inter UC transfer from Irvine to Berkeley. And the rest is for a lot of people, the rest is history. That's where it all kind of just started to take off um, in such a great, fun, on the forefront way that you know about, because we always yap about it ad nauseum to the younger players in the Cal program. Yeah, but I think what, what we might take for granted and when I talk to girls outside of our Cal program, that aspect of team culture and this team in general and that unity and, and um, the leadership that we have in our program is something that you embody as a person and everywhere I think that you've gone, whether you're a coach or you're involved in different programs or even as a player at Cal, like that's something you bring to the table. So can you tell us a little about the importance for you of the culture and how you think you bring that to whatever, because you know, most recently you're with the, the GA and you know, how you infuse your role of leadership and, and um, that culture into what you're doing. Yeah, I, it's a common line of mine that um, I really honestly, and people that know me, like, if you know me, you know me, there's like, I don't know another way to be like, you're probably remembering when you were a little tyke and I don't know, where were you, Wyoming or where was regional? Oh, Wyoming, the first time I saw you, yeah. <laughs> when, you're, when you're in Laramie, Wyoming, um, mm -hmm. you know, I still have players your age that either, you know, I coached against at Washington or that came through the regional teams that know me that pop up years later and uh, they, they don't think I've changed that much just, and I, I really, <laughs> you know, I, I hope I've evolved in some ways, but just in general, I just think I've, I've been the same. Um, and there's some things that are, that have always been important to me and honesty and integrity are one of them. I think with youth players and college players and people in general, I always wanted honesty as a player. And so I've never really been very different as a coach. Um, learning how to evolve and deliver that honesty has been probably been one of my bigger challenges um, in, in, in evolving as a coach and, and creating a culture where players know and your teammates know that you care about them to the point where if you have to deliver hard, honest facts to them, they know it's coming from a place of caring. Um, and I, I think that's the thing that sometimes even as a college coach, your players, it doesn't really sink in with them until years later, they're like, ah, she thought I was better than even I thought I was. So that's why she was kind of pushing me or saying, you know, being as, as brutally honest as she was. They, you know, somebody gave me a birthday present maybe like 10 years ago. It's this big mug that's got, it's engraved hashtag truth bombs. So I guess I'm known for dropping truth bombs. Uh, but I, I, I think that um, if you can create an environment where uh, you foster relationships in a way that people know that your honesty with them is coming from uh, a place that is um, meant to make them better is, is, kind of what I've always been about. Yeah. You, you, you transitioned at Cal from being a player uh, into being a coach. And so I'm curious, who are the coaches that came before you that you learned a lot of this from? Or is it more your own experience through coaching as a, an assistant to becoming a head coach? 
Yeah, I, I, I tell people, you know, and again, these are all things like you don't know at the time why and now where I'm sitting, I've, you know, pandemic and all a lot of time to look back and reflect like, how did I get here? Um, but, it, you know, the, the people that influenced me were always uh, peers and friends and teammates and I at Cal especially, but even before that, I, I, I've just been really fortunate to and I look back and I think of girls now and I think, God, are these girls empowering each other as much as my friends empowered me? I hope so. I really hope so because I, a lot of my strength comes from the women I've been around, to be honest with you. Um, and I was coached predominantly by men and there were these, you know, three in particular men, Brian Boswell being one of them, uh, Bill Merrill being another, uh, Clive Charles being another, who had this, in, and Ziggy Schmidt being another, the, those four men had a huge impact on, um, on me. Uh, and empowering me to lead. And, and Bill Merrill in particular, Brian was one who uh, put a lot of responsibility on me as a player on my youth club teams. Uh, and, you know, I, I just, I led from the field because he empowered me to. He, he, he I, I always felt like he expected me to, to be a voice, to be a leader. And uh, when I got to Cal, Bill was one who really honestly, he wasn't a soccer guy. And the people that grew up playing club for him um, knew that, but when we brought him to Cal, we knew he was going to be uh, a business savvy lobbying lawyer that had clout in a way with people that would get us to where we wanted to go. And he knew how to manage people and he knew how to foster relationships and what Bill didn't know about soccer, he entrusted to us. Uh, and he let us, uh, self coach is probably, he brought guest coaches in a lot for, for us, but he also let us um, manage ourselves in a way that it just made us feel like we knew what we were doing, whether we did or not. <laughs> we felt valued and we felt um, that, that we were able to kind of write our own story as, as players. And soccer is very much a player's game. Um, he would ask our opinions, which, uh, <laughs> you know, we, this will come full circle in, in a little bit about the Girls Academy and where my job is now. But I just felt that um, Peter Reynaud was another one. When I was at Cal as an assistant coach, I was there for four seasons with three different head coaches. So. Um, Bill left, I stayed, Peter Reno stayed for a year, he left, JP came, JP left, and Bill came back. <laughs> so I, I, there was a whole class of kids starting with uh, stiff arm your kid, Cassie, that's okay. <laughs> so so <laughs> the uh, so the the thing with uh, with that was that I was Joy Fawcett was you know, Joy Beefeld was a freshman, my first year as an assistant, and her whole class of players. I was the constant. And so I had to learn, like, I knew Cal because I played there. So all these head coaches that were coming in, it was like, oh, I know how you do this. I know how you talk to Dr. Lilly. I know how to go to this place. I know, you know, where, where we don't get our laundry done, but where we can go and, you know, sneak it into where the basketball does get their laundry done. I know where, you know, I, I knew the ins and outs of Cal. And so um, on the administrative side of coaching, it was very easy for me to leave Cal and go to San Diego State and start my own program because I'd done it all. I, I was in charge of all of it. Um, recruiting, the budget, the, I mean, we didn't have much of any of it. And so it was just, and I learned from Bill, just the, the idea of being a leader of people was something that um, I think so many of us learned from him. And at times it was awesome because I clearly wasn't the one that everyone listened to. I'm sure there was plenty of people that couldn't stand me. Um, but there, if, if, if they didn't, there was clearly a woman next to me that they were all like, yeah, I'll go to Tucka or I'll go to JT or I'll go to, you know, uh, because we all kind of exuded that ability to be able to manage ourselves and manage the program and put it in a place where we all knew we could compete and, and make it something special. Wow, that's a huge piece I, I want to know more of as we get through this, this talk, because the notion of ownership and autonomy for girls today is something I think that um, is a topic for sure to discuss. But, you know, you mentioned a lot of these prominent men, Clive, I didn't know that, that you were coached by Clive, but coaches like that who are known for coaching the person before they coach the player. And that is a huge aspect of creating a great team culture. So you went on to coach for 26 years at UW and I got the privilege of playing against you and, and seeing so many of the many players of very awesome players that you were able to coach and, and help find success. Um, tell us a little bit about how you infused what you learned from these coaches into that program. Yeah, I think the, the segue between Cal and, um, and, and Washington for me, a four year stint at San Diego State was a perfect one uh, because San Diego State was going from being club to varsity, which Cal did 
uh, there was no real conference games. We were still playing some division two teams, some division three teams. There was no budget. Um, Amy left Santa Clara and came down and volunteered for me for a year before she went to New Mexico, um, just so she would have time to train for the 91 World Cup. Uh, I used to pay Dave Vinoli out of my own pocket to help coach our goalkeepers. Uh, you know, I mean, there's all kinds, of, and no one was watching us, to be honest. That was the best thing, is that we could just kind of fly by the seat of our pants and through trial and error, try to build something. And I took, as I was, I was, I could play with them all still. That was one thing. And I was still playing. I was playing in sports festivals and training and still trying to make the national team myself and playing on the B team. And, uh, and so I just, everything I, I had done with my teammates at Cal, I was, I was putting my own twist on and, and looking around and seeing things I liked, things I didn't like from what other coaches did. And just learning more about the game, to be honest, because at that time, I felt it was the biggest gap for women trying to break into coaching was that we were seen as people that would keep the team happy, be friends with the girls, um, do the administrative things, do all the paperwork, make sure that we got on an airplane and, uh, you know, everyone had a ticket, which at Cal one time we managed to get to Florida and back short one ticket. Um, so <laughs> everyone, everyone made it there and back. Um, <laughs> But I, I, it was a perfect segue because I was able for four years to build something really special. And I'm still really close with the players at San Diego State. And I'm really close in age to the players at San Diego State that I coached. So, um, you know, they did an awesome thing for Amy and I when we retired from Washington, a, a party the, the summer before our last season at UW and down in San Diego. And it, it was just, you know, great for me to listen to some of their stories that I'd forgotten about. And some funny, some I'm like embarrassed about, but for the most part, I just remember, and Amy says this all the time, because when she went to New Mexico, she started from scratch too, is that as long as we're all on the same page, whether it's the right page or the wrong page, we're going to be way better off than we're all, if we're all on different pages. And I've never forgotten that. And so to get kids to buy into you um, from the soccer piece, and that's where I feel like my level of playing experience, my exposure to coaches like Ziggy and Clive, when um, you know, Clive, I, I, Amy played for him at one point. I don't think I ever played with him. I coached, played for him. I coached with him in ODP for a long time. And obviously he was one of our biggest competitors and rivals at Portland here at Washington. It was the rivalry in the Northwest. Um, but he was always so gracious to me and, um, person first, he could have cared less that I was a woman or I coached women's soccer. He could have cared less. I mean, Ziggy was the same way. There was no differentiating between male and female. It was like, you're a coach. Um, and he just, um, respected me. And it was interesting because there were male coaches who had credentials that didn't even hold a candle to what Ziggy and Clives did, who would treat me with no respect, lack of respect, whatever, until they got in a room with me, Clive and Ziggy. And all of a sudden their tune, tune would change a little bit. So, you know, I just look back on those times and I, I couldn't be more grateful for them to give me credibility in a room. Um, and I know today's a him Thursday for female footballers. And I, I noticed that you guys did that because I don't ever want anyone to think empowering women means bashing men. Um, but it, it does, it does mean trying to find the men that know how to lift up women and, um, and that are respectful to uh, the knowledge a woman has when they're in a room, because there's a lot of times when a man does walk in a room and the tone changes and it's, you're done. So, um, but anyway, those, those guys really, helped me segue to my time at Washington where I felt from day one, um, I walked into a good program. I wasn't a rebuild. It wasn't a place in shambles. Uh, I knew there was pressure to win because they had been, I think they were three years in to, to being a new program before Dang left and went to Texas. And so uh, I, I just knew there was pressure on me to win. And that's what I'd want, wanted since I left Cal. It was like, I wanted to be the best. I wanted to win the Pac-10. I wanted to win the Pac-12. I wanted to be coach of the year. I wanted our teams um, to make playoff runs every single year uh, and, and to try to get to a college cup. We went to the elite eight twice. I was PAC 12 coach of the year twice. Um, I, I, you know, the national team players, the, the players that came back to alumni games, our alumni game at Washington is a mirror of the one at Cal and nobody else in the country does it like those two places that I know this to be factual. Um, and that has a lot to do with how my playing career started. Um, and I'm hopeful that whatever happens at Washington now that I'm gone, um, continues because it's special. I mean, it's hundreds of women and their family. It's a, it's, it's something that's a part of them for the rest of their lives, just like it is at Cal. And that's what I brought from Cal to UW. Yeah. I mean, if there are any collegiate coaches listening in on this, I hope they take that with them because the power that the alumni programs can give to a college program is 
I mean, it's life changing and, and what you created up there is amazing. So out of curiosity, you know, was it difficult to leave? You know, you just retired after 26 seasons. How has that transition been and, and how emotional was that? Yeah, a lot of people say 2020, um, <laughs> 2020 has been brutal. Uh, 2019 was harder for me, to be honest. Um, you know, January of 2019 was when uh, the decision was made that I, wa I wasn't going to return after that last season. And I wanted to make sure that the narrative of 2019 was one that I wrote. Um, I think you just find that you come to a time where you just feel like there's got to be something different. And I think in, in soccer, I felt like 34 years total. And, you know, I'm not that old, but I, it's all I've been doing my whole life is, is college coaching. I've, I've had the opportunity to work with national teams. I've had the opportunity to travel the world and go to Ethiopia and Morocco and Europe and, you know, be in the Caribbean islands and coach women and people. And I mean, this game has given me so much more outside of just collegiate soccer. Um, but at the end of the day, if, if you spread yourself too thin or you start to take your eye off what your main priority is and you start to not resent it, but you just start to feel like, there's got, I, I, I felt like I had somewhere else to put my energy. I didn't know what it would be. Um, and so my last year was hard because it was really emotional, but um, I think Catherine's on this call and I've said this to her a million times. Um, I, I looked back on 2019 and, and from the time uh, the decision was made not to return at the end of the 2019 season until my last game that I coached in the second round of the playoffs in Florida, um, it, it not a day would go by that, um, I didn't feel some kind of extraordinary love come my way, like emotional, like, like people, you know, I said this to Catherine kind of morbidly. It was just like, people usually don't hear things about themselves. Like I heard, unless they die and you never hear them. So I had things that were done for me and things that were said about me and things that were given to me that were, um, you know, uh, tough to talk about because they're life-changing and the way they make you feel, um, not even the validation of it. It just makes you happy to know that you've done something that's impacted people enough to care to do that for you. So um, it was a roller coaster, to be honest. Um, but now, almost exactly a year to the day um, afterwards, uh, I can sit here and I can tell you that you know I still have a story to write in my career, in some way. Um, my legacy in soccer. Uh, will be about being impactful to girls and, and women, regardless of the age, whether they're coaches or players or, uh, you know, um, people in the game that, that want to try to find a way to stay in the game because they love it. And, and if it changes their life outside of soccer in a, in a positive way, then um, there's no greater satisfaction to me than that. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited for, for what this next part has to bring. That's so awesome. Yeah. And so for those people who don't know, in the middle of COVID, I guess in the beginning of COVID, we should say, um, the DA folded, right? And so the Girls Academy League started in April or May, is it? Yeah, uh, April 15th. So tax day is when U.S. soccer yanked, <laughs> yanked the DA out from underneath, uh, you know, the girls and the boys. The boys had a place to fall. Go figure. Um, MLS picked up the boys league uh, and, and developed MLS next in their academies and launched um, pretty recently, but everyone knew that that's what was going to happen. That's where the scramble kind of ended up for them. On the girls side, uh, you know, ECNL is uh, the other elite platform in this country where girls play. Um, the issue with ECNL for the kid for the, a lot of the clubs in the DA was that uh, the ECNL didn't want all of them. They either wanted to take their teams and dissolve some clubs, which would leave people out of jobs and clubs and business, or, um, or they just flat out wouldn't have had a, an elite platform to play in. They were getting kind of locked out, so to speak. And, and that's business and that's the way the markets work. And every, anybody that's ever been in youth soccer, um, I'm here to tell you for all the crazy things you hear about it, it's tenfold crazier. <laughs> and I now know this, um, I, I knew it going in, but boy, there's some things that, uh, I'm just uh, there's there's a there's a reason things are kind of you know gone the way they've gone and and so my passion has been um, watching a group of people put this the girls academy together for um, the right reasons basically saving the playing platform for seven thousand girls across the country uh, the uniqueness of the girls academy is that it's just girls it's not boys it's just it's our sole focus is elite girls competition and aspirational competition. So for second tier teams to be able to aspire to move up and for players to play up and develop. Um, the coaching education piece for me is, is a huge piece for people that know me. 
Um, it matters that if you are um, charging a child or even scholarshipping them or giving, uh, you know, players the ability to, or you're, you're having, you know, kids and families as paying customers, that you're giving them what you're selling them, <laughs> is that you're not saying one thing and, and then not doing it. And, and that's a, a, you know, it goes back to sort of the who I profess to be is that honesty and integrity and transparency are a big deal to me. And if you're telling someone you're going to do something, you're going to do it. And so if you talk about development, you're going to develop them as people. And if you're talking about playing a certain way and teaching them to be elite and giving them the tools to achieve, then you're doing that for them. And in our league, um, not perfect by far yet. Uh, but delving into it, I know the places where work has to be done on that front. And uh, it'll be my biggest passion is to make sure that, that these opportunities are ones um, that we've promised these girls. So the first thing the Girls Academy leadership before I was hired did was created an advisory panel for players. And this is where the full circle thing comes back. And it's probably, I had no intention of getting a job. I, I was supposed to be retired and going to JT's place in Hawaii and hanging out for a month. What's that? I thought you were going to be retired. And then like the next moment, I'm like, oh my God, she's like awesome. Yeah. I, I, went, I went and I did some coaching licenses and I was, at, I was in uh, the Caribbean watching the U20s uh, do their qualification in the Dominican Republic. And I went back to Florida to finish up an A license and we got sent home a day early because the pandemic hit. And then that had been three months into my retirement and I was going to travel and have some fun. And then all of a sudden my phone was ringing off the hook and like I was on Zoom and advising people and doing, and I was like, okay, I should get paid for it. What is happening right now? Like I was so busy and I'm like, I think I probably need to do something or this is gonna become a little ridiculous. So um, there were some professional opportunities coming my way and um, uh, a national team opportunity overseas. And I have an 81 year old mom that lives in Southern California and, and moving during a pandemic didn't feel right or seem right and going that far away. Uh, so I decided being able to stay at home um, and at least just do the coaching education thing worked out. So when they approached me about the commissioner job, the part I was talking about, the advisory panel that sold me, was this idea that it took me back to how I started soccer, is that my opinion was valued. Like what I thought about my own playing experience and my own pathway, someone cared about and asked me. I think we've gotten away from that with kids in general. Um, I don't think we ask them what they want. I don't think, I think we tell them what's best for them. I don't think we um, get feedback on what their actual experience is and um, what should be changed to make it a better experience for them. Uh, and so this advisory panel was created in our 69, 70 clubs uh, and there are seven conferences. So every conference has a, a girl that is probably in the U19 or U17 age group that is the conference rep that represents their entire conference. So in the Northwest, that'd be Northern California and Washington. Uh, there's one player that represents that whole group and then every club has a rep and then every team has a rep. So that the littlest girls at U13 have a team rep. And so they've already empowered each other with chains of communication, report, reporting to each other on what they're doing and how they're managing during the pandemic and what they're doing across the country for different team building things while they're not playing. If people are playing and other kids are sitting, you know, with FOMO on social media, sad that they're not playing, they're reaching out to each other because they know which markets are and aren't. And, um, and they, they care about each other. And there's just so many things they've already done to um, feel like they're in it together without the adults in the room. And if I can live long enough to like tag some of these kids and follow them for the next 10, 15 years, there's a, there's a group of women leaders coming that you're not gonna see the likes of because they've already at this age um, been given the baton to do with their life and their playing career, what they want to do with it. That is so refreshing to hear that, that girls are getting to take a little bit of ownership. I mean, I think a lot of programs, including mine, where we're talking about giving ownership back and finding autonomy, but a lot of clubs and, and teams don't give that option, you know? So girls are kind of at a loss half the time because they've never been asked their opinion on things and they're constantly told, or they feel that pressure to have to be a certain way and do certain things, even if they don't, you know, they're just not used to having to question it. So I think that is so awesome to hear. Yeah, and I, I, the only, uh, I know I'm like talking at you, but the- oh, I love it. No, I just, I think the, the other thing on that that I found, like, I wouldn't say resistance, but it's kind of the thing you would maybe expect is there are a lot of coaches and we know what the percentages of coaches look like female to male. So there's a lot of coaches who um, 
you know, the, the advisory panel has had to kind of grow on them, if you will. Um, so to, to give the players a voice hasn't necessarily been like, to me, it's like a no brainer. It's like, yeah, of course. And to them, it's like, well, you know, with these kids telling us that, that I'm like, it's not a matter of not coaching them and not guiding them and not supporting them and not, you know, being the expert in the room as their coach, but it is valuing how they think and how they, how they feel and what they want and, and listening to them um, and letting them have a voice in their own pathway. So, uh, you know, the adult education is, as you would expect, as ongoing as the youth education is in our, in our world. That's something that uh, in, in the female football I talked to the other day, we were talking about the notion of, um, you know, I'm a teacher in my day job and we're expected to know the standards of the content we teach, but we also have to know the developmental, socio, um, emotional side of the, the children and the age and the development that we're teaching as well. And in coaching education, there doesn't seem to be that avenue of having to learn about the age and, and you know, development, emotional development of who you're coaching. And is that something that in the future you think that coaching education courses will veer towards now that if we it can empower these girls to have a voice and hear what they're saying, maybe that can be a part of it. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, right now I'm doing a, um, I'm the lead instructor on an A youth license for US soccer. And one of the, the, the pieces to um, coaching training sessions and coaching games are the ages and stages for, for 13s through 19. So, uh, I mean, the document we have, it's a lot of um, on your own research. So within a course, you only have so much time to kind of delve into it because I personally think it's a course on its own. It's a lot like, you know, physical periodization. I think that's a course on it on its own too, but to understand um, the cognitive development that happens with, uh, you know, let's just say a girl in particular, uh, not, you know, but boys and girls, but that happens with kids between the ages of 12 and, and 18 or 19, it varies so much as much as their physical development does um, and paying attention to what those are. So, you know, as an example, right now, I have a coach, she um, is, uh, she coaches U 13s and U 17s. And she's, she's a little bit of a younger coach, but she's pretty experienced and she's very, very good. Um, she she's just now talking about like, I'm just realizing that my training sessions have to be different for the two of them. And not just from a physiological standpoint, um, from an attention span, from what matters to them, from what, where they are with their quote unquote seriousness about it, even though we all want the game to be fun and competitive and everything else, but what is it that, that they're there for? And if you don't understand that and you're just kind of cookie cutter coaching to every single stage and age, then, then you're doing the kids a disservice. So it is part of our curriculum. And I think, uh, you know, more so now than it was maybe even three and four years ago, but now just going through it with my candidates, I think it's something that every coach that coaches youth soccer should um, do their own research on more. And like I said, I think it could be a course on its own. Well, I'm thinking back to the coaches you brought up too, like a Clive Charles or a Bill, Bill Merrill, these types of coaches were special because they differentiated how they acted towards in each individual player. They had their standards, they had their style, but they made connection and relationships with these players. Uh, and that's kind of how you build culture too. So to differentiate a, a U13 and a U17 uh, session is, is huge because that's going to be your buy-in for those girls. And then they're going to have more of an opinion and feel like they can take ownership. So that's awesome. I love yeah. that. You know. Yeah. So switching a little bit of gears, um, you know, everyone wants to hear from people like you in these, um, these roles about your thoughts on some of the things going on in the soccer world. And one of them most recently being the pay equality uh, and the importance for the recent decision with the equal, you know, working conditions for the women's national team. So, you know, why do you think this is important, not just for soccer, but, you know, women and girls in, in the world in general? In life. In life. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it. It's like when people say Black Lives Matter. It's like, like the fact we're having this conversation still is just like, how could they not? Like what? And it's and equal pay and equal treatment and equal equal for all people. It's just it's really almost uncanny when you step back to think of it. It's still a discussion, uh, and I'm hopeful that this year, 2020 and the pandemic and the movements and anything having to do with social justice and women and equal pay and equal rights and um, that, that we, the, the young, um, that I would say that, that young people and the younger generations 
but not just them, but everyone comes out of this not forgetting what this time was about when we had all this time to kind of sit still. Like, like who wants to go back in the world the way it was? I don't. <laughs> uh, we have Something has to be different when we come out of this. It'll be the biggest shame if we don't. Um, back, back to the women and the U.S. Women's National Team, it's just such a... Uh, it's such an interesting prospect, the whole thing, you know, and comparing the men to the women uh, and the U.S. women's soccer team to the U.S. men's soccer team across the board, because, you know, people in soccer for the most part know, but people outside of soccer don't, that soccer truly is the world's game. FIFA, the global federation, is, is the richest, the biggest sports federation in the world. It's political more than you can even imagine. It might be the most political body in the world. I don't know. I'm just throwing out, you know over generalizations, but I'm pretty sure it's true. Uh, so to, to, to look at our federation and, you know, how our men are looked at globally and needing to succeed and how our women without being treated equally have already succeeded and where they sit in the world and trying to differentiate those two or explain them away in some way has now just kind of come to a head, if you will. So now it's like, it's not a matter of like how many World Cups we've won or how it's, it's treatment, it's, it's fair value, it's market value, it's breaking the cycle of, well, they only need this to win, so why give them any more? And who needs more of the market share and more of the commercial share and more of the, you know, and, and the women are always kind of backed into, well, here's your CBA and if you wanna play and this is your prime, if you're someone on the end of your prime and you don't agree to the CBA and somebody, you know, decides that they don't want you to, to be a part of the program, then there goes your chance to be an Olympian or be a World Cup champion. And so there's, there's all those different little nuances that, um, that play into it when it comes to national teams. And I think that, you know, when we look at professional sports and coaches pay, <laughs> um, you know, administrator pay, any, any kind of job opportunity the woman holds in a male dominated uh, profession, they're just, they're, there has to continue to be the fight for, for equality um, and equity. There just, there, there has to, because it makes no sense that there's not. I think that's the hard, you know, you mentioned earlier you had a couple great one-liners that I think some people in the chat have been quoting you on, which I love. And, Me uh, one-liners? One of them was, you know, empowering women doesn't take away from, from, you know, having men as allies. That's not what you said, but it was something like that. And I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I think that a lot of the time, just the notion of asking for equal pay or bringing it up as a female, you're judged for thinking that you're anti-male or... Um, I know even being a female footballers as our name of my company, it's, it's automatically you're anti-male or, or something like that. And that's not the case at all. I think it's just, you know, I agree with you. It's like, how can we, how are we still having this conversation? You know, yeah. <laughs> how is it equal yet? And so it's, it's bringing light to these types of issues that are still around, which is. Yeah. I, think, I think the best word you use Cassie is allies, be an ally, be an advocate. Um, but, th and that doesn't mean that you're, um, in charge of us, <laughs> that, that you get to determine us. Uh, and, um, and then there's a difference, you know, um, I I'll say that one of our partnerships in the girls Academy is with the MLS and people are like, Oh, why the MLS and not the NWSL? And well, sadly for the NWSL, they still, you know, they've, they've survived this long, a lot having to do with the Federation, um, supporting them in the early, early phases, uh, with their national team, allocated national team players. And there's, there's a lot more, um, this league has lasted longer than the other two leagues did. So there's some, there's definitely some ground hold and, and movement for that league, but for them to be able to, uh, they're a long way from being able to, you know, have 25 year existence at a high, high level where women are being paid as professionals in this country at a, um, at a rate where they can be a true professional and make a living, all of them. I'm from the first rostered person to the 25th. I'm not talking about just the top five. Um, so to partner with the MLS from a resources standpoint and for them to not want to at all run our league. Um, we are autonomous as a league, as a, a partner with the MLS. Um, we run next to MLS next. Uh, what we share are ideas. And what we share is when I sit, sit with their technical director, Fred Lipka, we share ideas about the game. We share ideas about standards. We share, we, you know, back and forth as equals, both directions. And I can't tell you enough in just a short period of time, not just how beneficial it's been for us, but how beneficial it's been for them. And he would tell you the same. Um, the number of things that he's called and said, hey, what would you do for this is like, you know, eye-opening. And um, 
and awesome. It's the way it should be, to be, to be honest. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that, that the allyship and advocacy and working together and collaborating is, is the dream world uh, for women's sports. That's awesome. I love hearing that because I do think that 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 topic kind of gets overlooked a lot by people when they, when they just hear certain words, you know, when it's feminism, you know, certain words have those different connotations. But um, well, you know, the purpose of these types of summits, I know you do a lot of these types of talks are to bring the community together to learn about, um, you know, people like you, what you're doing, to bring the leaders of the soccer world together to hear about um, these types of topics, but as a leader, what are you hoping to achieve in the next five to 10 years in what you're doing now that you have this kind of new platform and direction for, like you said, you have a lot you still want to achieve. So tell us about what you'd like to do in the next five to 10 years. Don't tell the board of directors who I work at the pleasure of, but uh, who employ me. Uh, but my life right now is literally day to day. Uh, no, I, I want to get past COVID has been brutal. You know, the commissioner of the NWSL took her job during COVID. The new CEO for USYS soccer took his job during, well, it was right before COVID. Uh, so this time has been interesting. And the good news for me is I feel like I can put a lot of energy into something that is um, it's, it's more of a passion. It, it's, it's exactly where you want to be when you're me is like, you want to be doing something where you feel like you can be impactful. It's, it's a passion for you. You're not doing it for financial gain. You're not doing it to get anywhere or do, I, I genuinely just want to have an impact, um, in the youth space for girls who I feel have been, um, the whole thing's gone a little bit sideways. If you ask me, it doesn't need to go completely backwards because we're living in, you know, uh, 2020, but we, um, we, we need to do something better by, by, these, by these kids um, uh, for their experience in the sport if we want them to stay in it. And we, if we want them to be lifelong soccer people and soccer fans and owners of teams and CEOs and commissioners and referees. And if we want women in our game, then we're going to broaden that vision for them at this level. And, uh, and I, I think that's exciting. I have, uh, you know, some other initiatives that when, again, we come out of COVID and when we can uh, be a thriving league and not... Um, just surviving is I just think there's we get to write our own script because we are an autonomous league and that's the fun part to me there's there's no one telling us can't you know it's, it's not going to be status quo it's just you know there's there's no point it's been there done that we're going to do some things that I think um, put the game um, in communities where kids haven't had the opportunity to play at an elite level um, we're going to work really hard to to find people that want to invest where kids are as opposed to plucking kids out of their backyard and moving them somewhere where they don't have a shared experience with their own neighbors. Um, and, and I think kids of color, um, that often happens way too often. We think of scholarshiping kids into programs usually means pulling someone out of where they live and putting them on a team where they're with people they don't even know um, or don't look like or don't have similar experiences with. So investing in those communities and kids and coaches um, there's no reason that that shouldn't be done. And we're going to work really hard to make it happen um, in and around where we put academy teams. That's awesome. Yeah, your guys' program, the Girls Academy, is it feels like the pendulum has been over here and you're kind of finally, it's kind of starting to swing and, and you guys are kind of on the forefront of that. So I yeah. think it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's hard to kind of break that cycle. You know, there's there's people who think the same way they've always thought. They've been in the throes of youth soccer and trying to keep their clubs and make a living and um, build their club into this big, you know, thing, and which is awesome. Uh, and there's a lot of great work being done out there by coaches, but just to get their mindset to shift a little bit more towards um, the bigger picture outside of their own club and even like conference wide and league wide to be thinking about uh, it from a, a whole and us standpoint, as opposed to just me within something is a, is a little bit of a mindset change for a lot of youth, youth coaches that have been in it kind of battling for the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think we have some questions. I want to make sure I give enough time because we're only at 10 minutes. But um, the first question is, any advice for working within our clubs as women? I'm one of two on the entire girls' side of my club, and it's been this way for a long time, and our area still doesn't embody the philosophy of bringing women into programs, negotiating salaries, gets laughed at, et cetera. So any advice for yeah. Find another club? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, you do have to keep you do have to keep fighting the good fight. I think that, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's tough. You, you have to fight. Uh, you have to make it matter. You have to have people um, 
you 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 have to be unpopular at times. Um, you don't want to always be like the the namesayer. Yes, I have my Cutco knives, Brittany. Um, <laughs> the uh, you. I don't know what the best way to say this is. Is that one? We all know that as a a, a female working in any male dominated field, that you have to be better than. And so to be better than means that whoever the paying customer is, it's not necessarily your employer, it's the parents. And if you're a youth coach, it's the parents and it's the kids. And if you're coaching those kids in a way that they're having a wonderful experience um, and no one's seeing that or hearing that, then it's your job to make sure that you get those people on your side advocating for you. Um, if it's not your boss, if it's not your, if those parents you know, were to go to a, a, a TD, a technical director or an academy director and say, listen, what, why aren't there more women coaching our girls? You know, that club over there has more women. We're going to, I think we're going to send our kid over there or, Hey, I heard that this coach might leave because she's the only female coach in the club, or you're not paying her as much as you're paying her counterpart on the boys side. Um, you got to kind of hit them where it hurts sometimes to, to be honest is, uh, and I think as women, maybe that's the thing we are guilty of most, if anything else, one, apologizing for being women and two, um, not fighting for ourselves like a man would fight for himself. Absolutely. Oh, you have so many good one-liners. I want to write them down. <laughs> it's being recorded. I love it. Yeah. Um, another question. That's such a great answer, though, too. Um, and I think, you know, it's nice to hear you say that, too, because some women are afraid to say that, even though that's the, the true answer. So I love that. Um, another question is, you know, how do we take the crazy out of youth soccer from the ground up and remove the political dynamics from the youth game? I'd assume you probably have seen those same political dynamics continue through collegiately and yeah i just i think from a for, for the youth game and the, the politics of it and the next shiny thing it goes back to what i said at the beginning is um and, and again i'm not trying to promote the girls academy i, I have control over that right now i'm the, the commish <laughs> um so i can and again i'm only going to be the way i'm going to be and there's things that that when i'm in a room and and when i have a decision to make it goes back to being for the players it'll be the thing i resort to every single time um, what's best for this club, what's best for Southern California or Texas or Washington or, you know, or, or this club that's got a better name than this other club that maybe does it right with the, has a better reputation than maybe a big club that doesn't. At the end of the day, my decisions are based around what's best for players and what's best for the whole league, not just for one entity, uh, regardless of what their reputation or stature is. I think that's the first thing. Uh, and that's way easier said than done, I know. Uh, but at the same time, I, I just am going to be the person in the room that um, when it starts to sound and look like business as usual in the youth landscape, I'm going to say, no, that's not the way we're going to do it. It's just, I know you guys have been in the thick of this forever and you think that it has to be done this way. It does not. You know, kids don't need to be flying all over Timbuktu to be seen. Kids don't, you know, there's a place and time for national showcases for the collegiate game for kids to be scouted and seen by other places. Um, there's a time and a place. Uh, to do that. It doesn't have to be all the time. It doesn't have to bankrupt families. It doesn't have to um, be a situation where if, because you can only, because you're someone that can afford it, that you get to participate when someone that can't afford it doesn't. Um, so, uh, you know, they're all the things that I just, I have to go back to decision-making and when it's decisions making, is it, is it what's best for the players? Is it what's most fair to every girl, not just to a group of girls or one club or one place. Um, again, way easier said than done, but it's the way I try to work. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Um, another question, budget and time constraints aside, what type of support do you wish you could give to youth female athletes that they don't have access to today? Um, oof, uh, I think we're doing it. I think we're very, very strategic in the Girls Academy about our partnerships. Um, you know, I know uh, O.L. Rain, Cass Cassie's working with you guys with female footballers and if the pandemic's taught us anything is how to engage kids and uh, particularly from a mental health and wellness um, and self training perspective on how to keep themselves um, engaged and self aware and well <laughs> mentally um, and some of the other partners that we have from an education standpoint um, from a the perspective of uh, being women that are in front of girls who've sat where they've sat and, and sharing their experiences, good and bad that they've been through, um, has been something that a, a lot of these players have never been exposed to. Um, and we were on a, a Zoom the other day 
uh, with Angela Hughley's and Meg Mangiano out of LA. Angela is a, an Olympian and Meg is a, is a fitness wellness person. And I'll tell you the best person on the call was our, one of our players and conference reps who, um, you know, even though I told her she's going to Stanford in two years or in a year, uh, her peers hearing her experience from her as a um, black girl growing up in mostly suburban white area and achieving what she's achieved and getting a scholarship to Stanford and how she's managed herself, not just during the pandemic, but in her own development from the time she was 11 or 12 on. Um, it was remarkable um, to hear the response from these kids being able to hear from another kid. And I don't think we often enough put um, players in situ practice and then we're gone or we're this or that and we have team meetings and we have our culture and our team building things. But are they ever put in rooms with each other where they're able to kind of have real talk, you know, and, um, and able to be able to hear and uh, hear from others and see people that look like them and maybe have a shared experience with them. Um, so uh, again, it goes back to, I think it's the most important thing we do is that we empower our players to um, have peer interaction that's meaningful on all different topics. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, this has been so awesome. I don't think I have any more questions. I don't know, um, Alicia, do you have any in your area? No, I think we're looking good. And I know uh, Leslie needs to get to her adult beverage. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Okay, yeah, we all do, I think. <laughs> I'll have you um, tomorrow night. I might wait a day. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of America Scores Bay Area, we really appreciate you, uh, Leslie and Cassie, coming um, out three o'clock um, to give us a lot of insight and um, really good information. Um, we have one more day of the summit tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll have a couple sessions from coaches um, from America Scores Bay Area. And we're going to have some youth on the panels. And then we're going to have a final session at three, which will be looking into the future and the lessons we've learned from these summits. And um, Cassie, I did write down a lot of Leslie's um, really good um, <laughs> sayings because- I on these. I'm taking notes. I didn't uh -huh. know this time. Hey, any, we have a heat press at our house. If anyone will go on a t-shirt, just uh, send them my way. Yes. We'll do a fundraiser for America Scores. Yes. Uh, that's awesome. I, I'm going to actually watch this again and write them down. I mean, because I got two that I really like. And um, yes, <laughs> you definitely are the queen of the one line or not the one liners, but the sayings because just awesome. Um, so on behalf of America Scores, everyone who is um, watching today, thank you so much. Once again, Leslie, um, Casey, thank you so much. And we will um, hopefully see most people tomorrow and have a good evening and a safe rest of the week. Thanks for having me, Alicia. And thanks to America Scores. It's been my pleasure. Cassie, always, always, always fun to talk to you. Go Bears. Proud of what you're doing. Keep it up. Thank you. Thanks so much. For I agree. This opportunity. It's so fun. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye, Alicia. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Cassie. Might see you tomorrow. Yeah, for sure. Say your hubby. I said hi. <laughs> Bye.